Here we are. I want to begin today's service. I don't have all the scriptures up here because the chalkboard's not that big. So, and that's, you would think that's enough, right? Well, I got a little bit more in hand. So, I want to begin today's service with starting, with saying a prayer for what is going on with Ukraine and Russia. It's been on my heart lately because it involves us. We may not live in Ukraine. We may not live in Russia. But we're affected by what's going on. So, but before we enter that prayer, I want us to read First Timothy chapter two, verse one to two. The Apostle Paul says this. He says, "Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life." and all godliness and reverence. The reason we want to pray for these leaders, whether it's Vladimir Putin, whether it's the president of Ukraine, whether it's President Biden, it doesn't matter. We want to pray for them because it's my desire, and I'm sure it's yours, to lead a quiet, peaceful life. What they decide to do affects each and every one of us. So it's so important we keep them on our hearts, and in our prayers. So let us let us begin today's service with praying for them and praying that God gives them wisdom. Lord, we come to you relying on you, who is the giver of all wisdom. Those who ask of you, you give generously when it comes to wisdom. We pray for the leaders of this world. We pray for Vladimir Putin. We pray that he, he will repent of what he's doing. It's horrible to see what's going on with people in Ukraine. We pray for a hedge of protection on them. None of us want anyone to die. We know that people have already died because of choices that have already been made. We know that the choices that are made will affect us who live here in America. We pray for these leaders the president of Ukraine, for Vladimir Putin, that your hand will be over this situation. Help us to never forget that your throne has been established in the heavens and you are ruler over all the nations. These people are set up in the position that they're in because you allowed them to be in that position. We may not understand why things are happening, but even in the midst of not understanding, help us to trust you who understands all things. We pray and we rely on you. We pray for the future decisions that will be made concerning this. We pray for all the other countries in the world who are, and the leaders in this world who are wondering what to do about this or any potential future threat that we might face um, with all of us here in this world. We just pray for your hand to be over this. We pray that you'll ease our hearts. I'm sure that many of us wonder what's next. What happens next? What will be the the result of the decisions that are being made? Help us to not be like the world who worries, but to forever trust in you. It's in Jesus we trust and pray. Amen. This morning I want to ask you, kind of going off of what's been said, what are you thinking about today? What are you thinking about today? I know I'm sure that Janet's thinking of her new little grandbaby. We all have a lot we're thinking about today, whether it's upcoming bills or car payments that you don't look forward to paying, or maybe it's your next paycheck. Maybe it's what your lawn's going to look like in the summer. I, I've been I've been wondering that myself about my own lawn. What What's my lawn going to look like? Am I going to have to take it to Tom to fix? Uh, my lawnmower, that is, because uh, you need a lawnmower fix. He knows what he's doing. Maybe, maybe you're thinking about your next birthday, what that's going to be like. Or maybe you're just thinking about what it's going to be like when you see your children again, which they may be adults, but I'm sure you still call them your children, your babies, which I know a lot of people who do. Or maybe you're just wondering what it's going to be like to spend time with your grandchildren next. The fact of the matter is we all have something that's on our mind and we all have plans for the future. And we're all expecting these plans to be fulfilled in the future each and every day. Our minds are constantly filled with something. I, um, I shared this a couple of years ago. Statistically, when it comes to the amount of thoughts a person thinks, 
it said that the average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. I don't know how they come up with this stuff, but that's what they say. And of those thousand thoughts, 80% were negative, 80% were negative. And ninety for and ninety five percent were exactly the same uh, rep repetitive thoughts as the day before, the repetitive thoughts. So eighty percent of what people think is negative, they say, and ninety five percent of the thoughts that they think were exactly the same repetitive thoughts they thought the day prior. Um, with the with what's been going on here lately with Ukraine and Russia, and with uh, the talks of a World War III becoming a reality. It's safe to say that many people this morning are having a lot of negative thinking. People are thinking to themselves, what's next? What's next for the future? What happens next? A lot of Christians are wondering about biblical prophecy and whether or not Jesus' return is as imminent as the scriptures declare that it is. So I, today's message is going to be short, simple, and sweet. And it's going to be distinctively, as every message should be, drawn from the scriptures. Because the clear answer to that question of whether Jesus is returning soon is an astounding yes. 100% yes. The Lord says in Revelation 22, verse 12, that's the first scripture on the board. If you can't, I kind of shoved them all together. They're kind of in a package. Revelation 22, verse 12. And Jesus, at the end of this book, the Holy Spirit speaks to us through Revelation. He says in Revelation 22, verse 12, Behold, I am coming quickly. Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. So I want to emphasize that Jesus is right at the door. Amen? Yes. Are you ready? I know I casually say that, but are, are, are you ready to meet your God who you have been worshiping your whole life? Because that is exactly what is going to happen. While we might have other things on our mind, besides Jesus' return, such as birthday, such as grandbaby, such as my baby, such as you know the wrath I'm to face when I get home, in the big picture of things, all of these things at the end of our lives have no eternal bearing or significance to what we are going to experience when Jesus raptures us up into the air to be with the Lord forever. So even though many of us, the reason why I said, you know, many of us may be thinking about our lawn, upcoming bills, whatever it is. When we die, we ain't taking none of that with us. So all the car payments you may have, all the lawnmowers you may have, all the collectible items you may have in your house, everything that you have is being left behind once, we, once you leave this earth. When I die, everything I own is being left behind. And even my family is being left behind. I am not allowed to take any of that with me such as my lawnmower, my TV, none of it's coming with me. And the only thing that's coming with us is us. <laughs> the only thing that's coming with us is us. It's so important to remember that every single day. Whether we die by the natural process of dying, what, however God determines that we die, however we're planning to die, that may be the way we die, or whether it's the day where the church is raptured up to be with the Lord in the sky forever. The point that we must understand, regardless of which way we go, is that God wants us to set our minds, purposefully making that decision to set our minds on things which are above. Colossians, this leads me to Colossians chapter 3. If you got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. Colossians chapter 3. We'll read verse. We'll read three verses. Colossians chapter three, verse one to three. Colossians chapter three, verse one to three. The apostle Paul says, "If then you were raised with Christ, seek."
seek those things. This is a this is a purposeful command for Christians to do. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind, set your mind on things above. Notice that this is not an automatic thing that happens with Christians. You got to wake up every day, even when you're grumpy, even when you're having a bad day. God says, I understand you're not going to be perfect today. However, you're to set your mind on things which are above, not on things that are on the earth. Why? Verse three, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. The way that I live today, the things that I think, the way that you live today, the things that you think are to represent the way Jesus thinks, are to represent the focus that Jesus had while he was on earth. Jesus was looking forward to the future. He was looking for, and wasn't really loving it, he was looking forward to the cross. He knew what he had to go through in order for salvation to be brought to mankind and in order to fulfill his father's will. He was looking forward to that. His mind was set on things which are above. So all of us who have died in Christ, which all of us have as Christians, we are to set our mind on things which are above. And with everything that's been going on in the past three years, I, I've put five years. I'm thinking these past three years have been pretty rough for the entire world. I mean, it's been terrible, to be honest. The past three years, and with in in addition to that, just when we think we're getting out of the pandemic of COVID, now we're hit with what's going on with Ukraine and Russia, and that's affecting us. I'm sure that will continue to affect us in the future. With all this going on, let's be honest, it can be hard to maintain a mindset of thinking about things which are above when we're surrounded by all this chaos. Just when we think we're getting out of the depths of the waters of the trials and tribulations with COVID, boom, we're hit with another. We're hit with another thing. And this is pretty serious with what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. I'm not trying to get political up here. This is just reality. This is, this, you can call it political, whatever you want. This is reality. This is the world that we live in right now. And I wonder about the future. I wonder about your future. I wonder about mine. I wonder about our kids' future. I wonder about Janet's grandbaby's future. This is very serious and very important. It can be hard to maintain a mindset thinking about heavenly things with the world around us seems to be getting more corrupt each and every day. But God commands us to do crazy things at times. Paul says rejoice always. Janet says just rejoice every day. Paul says Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. This is coming from a guy who's in a Roman prison cell, who's been through a lot, who's been beaten, whipped, shipwrecked, you name it. He's gone through a lot for his faith. We're here sitting in America, enjoying the liberty of being able to come here without fear of being taken out of the building, being thrown in jail. I mean, we got it made. We're, we're little babies being pampered here. Versus Paul who's in a Roman cell, rejoice always, I say rejoice. When I worked at the prison for the little amount of time that I did, I met a lot of great people who've done some very bad things. i tell you what, they had such a hope in their eyes because they knew, granted, they were locked up. They were locked up away from the temptations, many of the temptations in the world. Just because you're in prison doesn't mean you're taken out of temptation. Many times when you're in prison, you're supposed to join a gang. People want you to behave a certain way. And if you don't behave that certain way, well, you can get beat up, killed, or you know, cast off to the side. But when I met these people, I got to talk with them. I was a little more friendly than any of the other correctional officers were. I was very friendly, even to the point where there's this one guy on one of my shifts. All I did was hold the door open for this inmate. All I did was hold the door open. People were coming back. I think it was from one of their outings, one of their meetings they had, or maybe it was even from their lunch. They came back, held the door open for them. And I think it was uh, maybe a couple hours later, one of the guys I held the door open for, he came to me. He said, you know what? Thank you so much for treating me like a human being, for holding that door open for me. Blew my mind that this is how this is something little as that impacted him so much. Not trying to get off track. 
But when I met people who had come to Christ in prison, they had such a hope in their eyes. They had such a focus in their eyes that it didn't matter if they were locked up. Didn't matter at all. Their focus was on heavenly things. God commands us to do crazy things sometimes. And I don't understand why he does sometimes. He commands us to love our enemies. I'll tell you, let's be real with one another. That's a hard thing. When you see people, when you see what's going on right now, it's hard to love people who are making decisions that are killing people. Oh, it is for me. Maybe that's my weakness. I'll speak for myself. But Jesus nonetheless commands me to do it. Why? Because doing that represents God's love for everybody else. How I live, the way I think affects how the, how the world views Christ, especially if I call myself a Christian. Now, this leads me to the last days. You know your Bibles. You know the Bible teaches that it that in the last days, we can know for certain when it is the last days. In other words, you wonder to yourself, you got all this stuff happening with Ukraine and Russia. You have all these things that happened the past couple of years. Christians are thinking about biblical prophecy today. Understandably, I am too. Think about the last days. The Bible is crystal clear when you can know for certain when you are living in the last days. Just as John chapter 20 verse tells us that the reason why the gospel of John was written so that everyone who believes in, in the name of Jesus Christ will have eternal life. You can know for certain, 1 John 5, 13, that you have eternal life by believing in his name. Guaranteed. You don't ever have to question your salvation, ever. You can have that certainty when knowing that you are living in the last days. So there's four crystal clear passages. I, it's so great. It's so clear that I really don't even have to explain it. You know, it's the, these scriptures will be so self-explanatory. I'll expound upon them a little, but you'll be able to understand it. So turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, it's just two verses. Luke chapter 17, verse 26 to 27. Luke chapter, excuse me. 17, verse 26 to 27. Jesus is speaking. He says, and as, it was in the, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, and they were given in marriage. Until that day, Noah entered the ark, and the flood came. And destroyed them all. Jesus tells us that in the last days, people will be living their lives to the fullest. They'll just be living their life to the fullest as if there's nothing to worry about tomorrow. People will be getting married. They'll drink and they'll be having a good time. And what and what seems to be that or and it seems that they have no care for God or the or his warnings, just like it was in the days of Noah, Jesus says. When he entered the ark and a flood came and destroyed all the people outside of the ark. The sad, unfortunate reality that Jesus says is that people will also be destroyed by the wrath of God in the future that is to come. That's so important why people get saved today. So they don't have to worry about that. Second scripture, second Timothy chapter three, second Timothy Chapter three. You know, there's some doctrines in the Bible that are kind of hard to understand and you got to bounce around. But this isn't one of them. It's, it's really not it, uh, how, how clear the scriptures are of when you can know you're living in the last days. Second Timothy, chapter three, verse one to seven. The Apostle Paul says this. Second Timothy, chapter three, verse one to seven. But know this, Timothy, know this. Talking to a preacher. That in the last days, perilous times, in other words, difficult times, will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Do you see anybody loving themselves in this world? Lovers of money. Do you know anybody who loves money? Boasters. Do you know anyone who boasts about their wealth or their achievements in this life? Proud. Do you know anybody who's proud? Blasphemers. Do you know anybody who blasphemes the name of God? Disobedient to parents. Do you know anyone who's disobedient to parents? I do. Sometimes. 
unthankful. Do you know anyone who's unthankful for the country that they live in? Do you know anyone who's unthankful just in general? Unholy. Do you know anyone who's unholy? Unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people, he warns Timothy, turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to to the knowledge of the truth. Do you know anybody who fits that nice section of description of people? Come on. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you know that we're surrounded, surrounded by people who live that type of life, who behave that way every single day. The scripture is clear. In the last days, people will behave this way. You don't have to go to a commentary section. You don't have to listen to your favorite preacher online. Open the scriptures and just read it. You don't have to connect the dots. You don't have to fit it into your theological beliefs, whatever it is. Scriptures are clear. People will behave this way in the last days, and that's exactly what's happening today. And in 1 John chapter 2, I want us to go to that scripture. 1 John chapter 2. Now, this is an interesting portion of scripture that we will talk about in the future near future first john chapter 2 verse 18 first john chapter 2 verse 18 and then right after we read that we're going to jump to chapter 4 of the same letter in verse 3 so just preparing you first john chapter 2 verse 18 little children it is the last hour and as you have heard that the antichrist is coming even now, many antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Read that again. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. All right, jump over to chapter 4, verse 3. Kind of gives you a little description of these little antichrists the Apostle John's talking about. Read, actually, we'll read verse 1 to 3. 1 to 3. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. I'll stop right there. Just because you hear someone preaching the word of God, and they may have good intentions, always test what a person t- tries to teach you. Not because you're just trying to be mean, or that you just want to doubt in everything they say. Test everything I say. Test everything anyone says. Because there's people out there who lie. <laughs> That's just the fact of the matter. Anyway, that's kind of off topic. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are, are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and now it's already in the world. The Holy Spirit here tells us there is someone who is called the Antichrist. There is someone who is called the Antichrist that is coming, but in the meantime, there are what you could call these many Antichrists who are already here. And it's in 1 John 4, verse 1 to 3, that we learn that these, what you call, you could call them runner-up antichrist, they represent the true spirit of the antichrist who is to come by denying that Jesus is from God and that he didn't come in the flesh. There are people back in these days where the apostle John wrote this, that people were teaching this, that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. And clearly they were teaching that he went from God. There will be, there's a future time coming where there will be the Antichrist, and this is what I'm saying. We'll, we'll talk about this in the future because I don't just want to off the cuff talk about this because this is a serious doctrine um, within the church that we need to understand. But in the future, there will be this man known as the Antichrist who arises, um, and Israel will have to do with that. The church really doesn't have anything to do with that. 
and we'll focus on that in the future. But this leads me to my conclusion. I shared these three scriptures with you this morning, not for the purpose of inciting fear within you. Some Christians could read these things and they could be a little fearful. Um, even though they know they're going to be with the Lord soon, the whole process of dying can be a little fearful. The whole process of being raptured up into the sky, you don't know what that's going to be like, can be a little fearful. So I don't say any of this to incite anyone with fear. Rather, I, I share these truths with you this morning because of everything that's going on, and I'm hoping that these can comfort you. All three of these scriptures, every single one that we just read, are being fulfilled today. Each and every day, all of these scriptures are being fulfilled before our eyes. Every day. So number one, we are 100% living in the last days. I say that confidently. It's, the Bible seems to be crystal clear that this is how the world will be in the last days. Well, if you look around, it looks like that. And it's looked like that for quite some time. And number two, the rapture is about to take place. I don't know when. I don't know when. But it is most definitely about to take place. Now, if you hold to the pre-tribulational view of the end of times, which I believe is the biblical teaching of the end of times, which means that you believe that the church will be raptured before the seven-year tribulation period, not, not in the middle of it or not after, before, um, you understand that the Bible teaches that the only event that the church is to be looking forward to next is the rapture. That's, that's what you're, and that's vital to understand. What, how you get this, we'll talk about Matthew 24 later in the future, because Matthew 24 is a foundational scripture or a portion, of, a section of scripture that talks about the end of times, but that has to do with Israel. And not the church. And we'll explain that later on. I know that's kind of a big thing to throw at you and leave you with today. But I encourage you to go home and read Matthew chapter 24. But understand that God has two different ways of dealing with the church in Israel. There's a certain plan for the church and he has a certain plan for Israel. That's just how God works. That's just how God works. And if you understand that, a lot of the Bible won't be as confusing. Because many people open up the scriptures today. They'll read a portion of what Jesus said during his life and they'll apply that to themselves. When in fact, that doesn't, Jesus isn't talking to Gentile Christians. Jesus isn't talking to the church. He's talking to Israel because God has certain things he's going to do with Israel. Israel is going to experience certain things that the church is not going to experience. Maybe that's not fair, throwing all that at you this morning and just leaving you with it. Uh, but it's so vital to understand that because once you understand that, the scriptures and what Jesus says will start, it will start to make more sense. And I'm not saying you won't, you'll just understand. I'm not saying you'll understand all the scriptures and everything that Jesus says. Who would be arrogant to say that? But you'll have a better understanding of what he's saying. So we're not to be thinking, all of us here, we're not to be thinking that we're going to experience the seven-year tribulation that Daniel prophesies about in the future. The only thing that we're supposed to be looking for is a rapture. I praise God that's the case. Because Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back and I'll, I'll get you. And I'll take you where you need to go. How troubling would it be knowing that you have to experience a seven-year period of tribulation? That would be very troubling for me. Thankfully, that's not what the scriptures teach. So I want you to take comfort in the scriptures that we talked about today knowing that these rumors of wars that we're hearing about today that are currently being stirred up within the middle east knowing that all that's happening just keep in mind that the rapture is right at the door just keep in mind that the rapture is right at the door i don't, like i said i didn't have enough room to write these scriptures on so i want to close today's message with two scriptures um first thessalonians 4 if you got your Bible, you can turn there. You can listen to me. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 to 18. First Thessalonians 4, verse 15 to 18. Paul says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until, 
until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, the reason why Paul says this, verse 18, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. I'll say it again. Comfort one another with these words. These are comforting words. At least they're supposed to be. <laughs> At least they're supposed to be taken that way. And the last scripture I want us to read is 1 Corinthians 15. This, this connects right with 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 to 58, and then we'll close with prayer. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 to 58. Give you a minute to turn to it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 to 58. Paul says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery, Paul says. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. Remember what you just read in 1 Thessalonians 4. The trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, this flesh that we live in, with all of its imperfections and impurities, it must put on incorruption. And this moral must put on put on immorality, immortality, excuse me. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this moral has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives the victory through the, our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast in light of all these truths. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. All that requires us to keep our minds set on heavenly things. And let us pray that God will help us do that. Amen. All right, let us pray. Father, we thank you for how clear the scriptures are concerning the last days. We pray that you'll keep us strong. You'll keep us uh, not from you, you'll keep us uh, standing firm. You, you will help us not be movable, that you will help us to continue to uh, abound in work for you in this life. Help us to be lights in this world. And as this world gets darker and darker, help us to be brighter and brighter each and every day. We are living in the last days, it seems to be. And just help us to be ready. Help us to have our minds set on, set on you. We have so many concerns for the future. But help us to remember that you are already there. You are already in the future. You already know what's going to happen. And it'd be foolish not to trust in the one who knows what's going to happen. Help us to have our faith in you and to let this faith direct our steps. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.